second job is what they say. I got three jobs and I'll tell you what. I'm sick and tired of had enough. Washington, D.C. I am you know, one of your moderators for this evening. Let me introduce you to Sierra. Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for join us, joining us. You could be anywhere in the world right now, but you're here with us. And it, it is a great day to be together after May Day to celebrate the legacy of General Gordon Baker and Detroit's Black radical tradition. I'm Sierra Taylor. I'm based here in Harlem, New York. I am a part of the Popular Education Project uh, with Carolyn and Zilla, as well as the uh, National Welfare Rights Union. And uh, again, just thank you for having us and, and joining us today. We wanna start off uh, by introducing the man who brought us, uh, who has brought us all together and has brought together people and struggle the world over for uh, decades and, you know, even more to come. 
General Gordon Baker Jr. was born and raised in the city of Detroit. He is one of the most important freedom fighters and revolutionaries of the 20th century. Delivered into this world by Dr. Ocean Sweet on September 6, 1941, Baker spent his entire adult life fighting against the violence of racism, poverty, capitalism, and imperialism for a better world. General remained a central and galvanizing figure in radical politics, both in Detroit as well as nationally and internationally until his death in 2014. Baker engaged in a wide array of political and labor formations during his adult life, including the NAACP youth chapter at Highland Park Community College, the Nation of Islam, the African Nationalist Pioneers, the Group of Advanced Leadership, the Freedom Now Party, the Megar Uhuru, and the Revolutionary Action Movement, or RAM, the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, DRUM, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, LRBW, the Communist League, the Communist Labor Party, UAW Local 600, and the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. That's like a whole timeline of struggle right there. Uh, General was a natural organizer who maintained strong and enduring relationships with Black liberation, grassroots, and radical activists in Detroit and around the world. In the late 60s, he was the primary conduit that brought together Detroit's distinctive class-oriented Black power movement, connecting movements intellectuals to Detroit's Black working class while building working relationships with disparate groups of grassroots activists. Beginning in 1968, Baker and his comrades in the League or in the Revolutionary Union Movement and the League engaged in a number of wildcat strikes to combat racism, production speedups on the job, and the UAW. General and the LBRW hoped these battles would give a rise to the growth of Black Revolutionary Party that could challenge and overthrow the capitalist system. But racial, legal, and labor reforms, as well as the subsequent split within the group, precluded this from occurring. Following the League split in 1971, Baker and his comrades joined the Communist League, which subsequently evolved into the Communist Labor Party and later the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, Black-led anti-revisionist communist movement that were under the leadership of Nelson Perry. Again, we are so, so honored for all of you to be joining us and to engage in this history of a revolutionary um, and we will start it off first. We're going to intro with the clip of General Baker talking about how Detroit he actually was. And before we start the clip, can we just do one housekeeping notion um, or moment? Um, if you need closed captioning, please press more and then hit closed captioning to activate it on your screen. Thank you. Back to you, Sierra. I was born in Detroit. I got one other little blemish on my birth record, and that is uh, Dr. O.C. and Sweet, uh, the famous doctor uh, that uh, came and built a, a house over in the white community that was surrounded in the tax. It's a lot of books written about his story called The Ark of Justice. Well, he delivered me. His signature is on my birth certificate, and my mama used to talk about how much she liked Dr. Sweet. So that was my introduction to the city. I was, I was born and bred here. The political struggle is always higher than the economic struggle. The economic struggle is a struggle where you fight, you can't fight for nothing but reform. You want better conditions of your labor, higher pay, uh, all those things. Political demands are different. Political demands are demands against the government. And that's a higher level of struggle than the struggle against the economic demands at each plant. Because it unites us as a class, right? You're no longer fighting an individual employer. Now you're fighting a whole class of people that set against you. Mm -hmm. We see that as a higher form of struggle. Thank you. And shout out to Colleen and Rita who are running tech for us. 
Elizabeth, who is doing the closed captionings. And thank you so much for Pam for being very intentional about being able for all of us to participate. Today is going to be a wonderful panel. We are joined by Carolyn Baker, daughter of General Baker, an organizer educator at the General Baker Institute. We will also be joined by David Goldberg, professor of history and African American studies at Wayne University and author of the forthcoming biography of General Baker. Pam Sporn, our leaders bringing us together here, uh, director of Detroit 48202. If you haven't had a chance to check that out yet, it will be available for a couple of more days. We're going to kick off this incredible event by another native born and bred Black revolutionary from Detroit, Dr. Barbara Ransby, who is an award-winning historian of the Black Freedom Movement, director of the Social Justice Initiative at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and a leader in the movement for Black lives. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ransby. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, CR. And I wanna really thank the organizers of this event. I've been on webinars um, all week long. And of course, yesterday was May Day. So I was very excited and looking forward to this um, May Day panel honoring the incomparable General Baker and the wonderful filmmaking talent and commitments uh, of my sister Pam Sporn, uh, and just to be with this, uh, this great panel. Um, this is not an academic presentation. So anyone who is expecting that, you will be disappointed. Uh, and I'm gonna be brief because I'm really looking forward to uh, to the other remarks and to our conversation that will follow. What I want to offer are some reflections on the Black radical tradition and De Detroit's place in it um, as a historian, as an activist, and of course, as a Detroiter. You know, there's a number of sort of quote unquote revitalization uh, campaigns and capitalist branding schemes that use the label made in Detroit. Uh, well, in many ways, I think about that. I think I was made in Detroit in a very different kind of way. Um, I grew up in Detroit in the 1960s uh, and 70s, which was an amazing time. Uh, most people remember the 1967 rebellion uh, as a landmark political event, as a really you know, pivotal and galvanizing event. And, and I do too. I was 10 years old at the time. And in some ways, it's my first political memory. I was trying to make sense of the politics of race and rebellion, um, you know, and, and capitalism, even though I didn't have a name for it. Uh, but I also remember the years that followed as a time of rich, robust, and sometimes raucous uh, political community um, as uh, organizers and activists and rabble rousers and amazing human beings uh, came together in all kinds of forums um, and in organizations uh, in Detroit. And, as a teenager, I observed some of it, but I was also fortunate enough uh, to meet a number of, of people who were defining figures in that period. You know, I was reminded as I thought of today's gathering of people like Gloria House, uh, who's also known as Aneb Kotsitsile, uh, was active in SNCC, uh, was of course a talented, is of course a talented poet and writer, was engaged in South African and Cuban solidarity, uh, later doing political prisoner work. She and I worked together around the release of um, uh, Ahmed Rahman, uh, former Black Panther. I think of people like Kenny Cockrell, the lawyer and co-founder of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. I, I observed as a teenager, many of Kenny Cockrell's very theatrical uh, uh, speeches and, and orations in which he broke down complex ideas uh, and, uh, and challenged you uh, to debate uh, if, you, if you were inclined. Um, and then there was Jimmy and Grace Lee Boggs, leftist organizers and intellectuals. Um, their uh, evolution and revolution in the 20th century was kind of my introduction uh, to, to uh, the big idea of, of revolution as a possibility. And then Walter Riley, former bus driver, labor organizer, black communist, now people's lawyer in Oakland. Uh, and then there was General Baker, who was, um, this figure to be uh, in awe of, you know, and an auto worker and organizer extraordinaire, but also this powerful thinker and intellectual, a person who, um, you know, we not only knew of as one of the, you know, uh, forces within the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and the Revolutionary Union Movement, uh, but also someone who, who had a, a command of a large uh, bulk of information, analytical frameworks, 
theories, history, et cetera. And I have to say, you know, I, I, my day gig is, is as a professor and I'm you know, trained as a historian. But when I think of those um, very larger than life intellectual figures, I know he's a political figure. I know he was an auto worker. I know he was, you know, a brother that organized people on, on the corner, but he was also this powerful, powerful thinker. And those two things were related. And it gave me a sense of possibility of what intellectual work in service to movement looks like and the importance of taking ideas seriously uh, in the context of that work. You know, uh, Detroit was the host of a variety of sectors of the left from uh, revolutionary nationalists to uh, black socialists and communists. Uh, as Cedric Robinson, my late friend and, and colleague uh, talked about the black radical tradition, he talked about it as bringing together a myriad of paths that black people have taken to try to get free and to navigate a path toward liberation. It is distinct from finding a room or a corner or a basement in the dilapidated house of racial capitalism, but rather represents the struggles and strategies and movements that have been crafted in the process of trying to build uh, something new. I think of uh, my own work as a organizer and uh, a, a writer and a historian, and, and it's been very much influenced by the traditions that I witnessed and had the privilege of being a part of uh, during my younger years in Detroit. My work on Ella Baker attempted to map out some of the crevices, crevices of the black radical tradition that are often ignored, uh, the role of women, the ro role of radical women, uh, the role of grassroots ad, uh, activists, and the democ radical democratic threads of that tradition that reject the politics of respectability. My work on Aslanda Robeson tried to tap into that anti-colonial and anti-imperialist uh, 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 part of the tradition. And more, most recently, um, my work with the Movement for Black Lives um, has highlighted the role of Black left feminism. All of these strains and threads were strains and threads in the Detroit uh, movement that, again, as a young person uh, on the fringes of the movement at that time, um, very much informed my work, my sense of the world, my sense of possibility, and my sense of my obligation uh, of the work I needed to do uh, in the world. Um, in terms of my own activist praxis, you know, there are many chapters of it, but um, one of the most significant in, in terms of our purposes today and, and where I have very vivid memories of Jen Baker is a Black Radical Congress, which convened about 2,000 Black Radical activists and artists and writers intellectuals in Chicago uh, in 1998. Um, and, and Jen Baker's presence uh, was very much felt uh, at that event. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, Detroit was the epicenter of the nation's uh, uh, Black radical tradition in many ways. And we have from the bold and brazen and beautiful to the wild and wacky uh, uh, conversations, organizations, campaigns, um, et cetera. But I think of three themes that are very palpable um, in the movement today that, uh, that emerge out of Detroit. And one is what we now call intersectional radical politics. All intersectional politics are not radical because they don't map all the intersections, uh, but, but radical intersectional politics. And what I mean by that is looking at the ways in which race and class and gender come together, right? Uh, so when you have movements that are talking about the racism of the cops, and of course we were talking about it in Detroit uh, in the 1970s, the, the racist program stress, stop the robberies, enjoy safe streets, was this police decoy unit that was setting up uh, uh, and then uh, beating and, and, and committing all kinds of acts of violence against our people in the alleys and all kinds of places in Detroit. So there was that, but that could never be separated from the class politics because everybody was connected to the auto industry in one way or another. You either work there, your parents worked there, your parents worked at an industry connected to the auto industry. So the idea of an industrial working class that was largely black in the communities I lived in, uh, that were fighting both racism of the state uh, and the exploitation of, of capital was, was, was just a given. The thing I think uh, the movement was weaker on was a question of gender, but even at that time, uh, people like Marianne Kramer were holding sessions on what was then called uh, female liberation. 
The other characteristic I think of, which um, was really important to me in that time is internationalism. So, you know, my world was very small as a black teenager. My parents had come from Mississippi and Georgia as sharecroppers and worked in the factories. They were working class people. Uh, they hadn't traveled any place in the world. Uh, we didn't know anybody that had been any place in the world, you know, kind of got glimpses of the world through books and television. But to the degree that I went to and participated in discussions and forums at Wayne State and other places in the city and read publications like the Inner City Voice and the Black Panther uh, Speaks, I got a window into a larger world that I felt connected to, that I saw parallels in my own experience. Uh, and that I felt I had to engage. Uh, the war in Vietnam was going on, anti-struggles in Africa, uh, the world was on fire. And, and the radical activism of people like Jen Baker and the Boggses and Walter Riley and others in Detroit at that time gave us a sense of connection to the world and insisted that we have a commitment to a world struggle. And then the final thing I'll say uh, in terms of that tradition is the intellectual vibrancy. Um, I spoke about this a little bit when I was talking about uh, Jen Baker as a people's intellectual. But I think sometimes, you know, it, it, the discussion between doing and thinking about what we do gets bifurcated and people say, well, I don't, you know, we don't have the luxury to sit around and, and read something. We don't have the luxury to debate something. Uh, but some of the most serious activists involved in some of the most high stakes struggles that you can imagine including in Detroit in that period, South Africa in another period, um, revolutionary situations all over the world, have insisted on making room for str struggle and study and debate. Uh, and Jim Baker was, uh, was a model for that. So I'll just you know, close uh, you know, by saying, you know, as I think of the example of someone like uh, Jim Baker, you know, I think of every uh, radical is not a revolutionary. Every radical thinker is not an organizer. Everyone who is an organizer does not have the patience and humility to move large numbers of people in thought and action and to hold on to their own integrity and humanity in the process. And when I think of Jen Baker, and I didn't know him intimately, I, I, I knew him, but I didn't know him as well as obviously some other people participating today. Um, but but my image of him, my impression of him, the way he landed and, and impacted me was that he was precisely uh, that kind of person. And we indeed more, uh, need more Jen Bakers uh, in the struggle today. I'll stop there and I look forward to the conversation. So coming out of the rebellion, that's why we turn all our work towards organizing inside these factories, because that's where we had strength, and that seemed to be the only place they needed us. So within a, within a year's time, after the end of the rebellion, Drum was born, and that's when the organization in the factory kind of took off. What is Drum? What is Drum was called the Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement, and it was, uh, uh, it was at the Hamtramck assembly plant that made the Dodge car. Everybody used to refer to that Hamtramck assembly plant as Dodge, Maine, or old Dodge, Maine. And because of that, we just named it Drum. Uh, we, we weren't going to be a new union. Nope. We weren't going to be nobody's caucus. So we declared ourselves a revolutionary union movement. And we were Dodge because that's what we made there. And it, what we did was <laughs> we're not on, you know, although the workers inside the factories would lay the foundation as mm -hmm. to what the newsletters looked like and how they, we began to set up a printing apparatus. Uh, mm -hmm. Women was backing that up mm -hmm. because we did the typing. We knew mm -hmm. how to, you know, began the learning how to put the stuff together. A lot of folks didn't know how to do a leaflet. I mm -hmm. remember I took me, mm -hmm. I went in the office one day and I said, Jen, I got to put this mm -hmm. leaflet together mm -hmm. for the... I sit up there all day. He, you can't put that out. It don't look that good. And he was learning too, mm -hmm. you know. And so we all learned how mm -hmm. to put these leaflets together, mm -hmm. how to justify with uh, out a um, without a justifying machine because these old justifying machines that the newspapers had used at that time, mm -hmm. they would work sometime and then sometime they didn't. So mm -hmm. our people got together and learned how to, we would learn how to 
justify all our little newsletters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but that became the tools for organizing, not only just in the factories, mm -hmm. and not only just in the schools, but in the hospitals also. I'm loving these little snippets of history. Uh, and if, again, if you haven't gotten a chance to check out Detroit 48202, you will have a little bit more time, but do not sleep on this. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ransby, for opening us up. Uh, for folks who are on our Zoom, just so you know, we will have a question and answer portion at the end. Please use the chat, uh, or sorry, use the Q&A function to uh, enter your question, and we can get to it at the end of the uh, opening statements by folks. I want to next introduce David Goldberg. I had the opportunity to get to know David as much as you can get to know someone over Zoom during the pandemic in a, a course that the General Baker Institute was holding on the Negro national colonial question that was written by Nelson Peary and members of the Communist League. Um, David teaches African-American studies at Wayne State University. He is also affiliated with the General Baker Institute, as well as the annual Detroit Speak Speaker Series. He is currently working on two books about General Baker, a reader as well as a biography. David, thank you so much for joining. Um, I'm ready for you to drop gems. It's been a, a pleasure to get to know you. Well, so thank you for that. I don't know about uh, gems being dropped. I clearly drew the short straw by following Barbara, so I'll do my best. But and my voice, you have to excuse me today. My son had his first soccer game the other day, and he damn near scored, and I lost my mind, so my voice is a little off. But uh, I think, you know, Barbara had it uh, exactly right regarding general. And I wanted to maybe tell a few stories that I think would echo some of the points that she was uh, making. Uh, he was the, one of the finest historians I've ever met. Uh, you know, we used to, he used to find documents that I couldn't find in the same archive. So he was, uh, you know, Jen used to say, we have to turn thinkers into fighters and fighters into thinkers. And he was the amalgamation of those two, right? And that's really uh, the struggle. Um, he was an internationalist, as was mentioned, too, and because it's May Day, I wanted to tell a quick story about this, and Pam will talk a little bit more about his trip to Cuba later. But I always love this story because General liked to, I think, talk about it in, in terms of his kind of evolution politically. He started off as a pretty uh, dyed-in-the-wool black nationalist. In fact, by the time he was about to go to Cuba, he was uh, planning on getting a job in the auto industry so he could learn a trade with the intention of taking that trade to liberated African nations and helping them with their uh, so socialist development, right? So this is in kind of like 1963, I planned on, on taking off. But anyway, he in 1964, he's part of a, a group of, I think, 84 people that go to Cuba, uh, students, uh, and, and they're violating the uh, travel embargo. Uh, and so Jen goes with, and I should make mention of, of these gentlemen's names, but he goes with three other people from Detroit, uh, Charles Mao Johnson, uh, Charles or Baba Charles Simmons, and uh, Luke Tripp. Uh, and they go down there and they meet with a number of people. They're very excited to go down there and meet with, they obviously meet with Fidel Castro. In fact, they play baseball with him. They meet with uh, Che Guevara, of course, but they were particularly interested in meeting with Robert F. Williams, right, who was a hero to them. Uh, Robert F. Williams from Monroe, North Carolina, right? And uh, <clears throat> anyhow, while they're down there, they're down there for a couple months and they're looking at their passports and on the passports, it had all the lists of the other nations that they couldn't go to. Uh, so they started looking at it and something struck them. Uh, you know, on this list uh, is a series of nations, but it wasn't kind of like the ones that you would assume, right? Russia wasn't on there, right? East Germany wasn't on there. You could still travel to those places. You could travel to those. I shouldn't say still, because they changed it uh, shortly before. But you couldn't travel to North Vietnam. You couldn't travel to Cuba. You couldn't travel to China. And you couldn't travel to North Korea. But there was one other nation that they couldn't figure out why it was on the list, because they're operating on kind of a third worldist Maoist lens. And lo and behold, it's Albania, small Eastern European nation, uh, you know, and so they what they did was that they're operating on the principle that 
the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So they went to each embassy to talk to the people, tell the story about the plight of black people in America and to talk to their ambassadors. And they came to the Albanian embassy and they said, look, you know, uh, we, we didn't understand quite frankly why, why you were on this list. And the Albanian, uh, the guy at the Albanian embassy shook his head and he said, my friend, we've been fighting imperialism since Julius Caesar. And then they got it. Uh, but, but I think I bring that story up to show you the internationalist element of this, but also to show you that Cuba was a turning point, I think, for General. Obviously, he came back. He didn't wind up going to Africa, and he cast down his bucket where he was, and he started getting to work on building a Black radical revolutionary movement in Detroit. Uh, and so while we think about uh, Drum which he's most uh, known for in the Revolutionary Union Movement, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. What isn't as well known is the fact that they started to build out this idea uh, around 1964, 1965, upon their return from Cuba. Uh, there was, uh, they put forth a black newspaper called Black Vanguard, right? And this was an organ associated with the Revolutionary Action Movement, but also associated with the student group that they had developed earlier at Wayne State called Uhuru. Uh, and what they used to do is they would read articles from Robert F. Williams. In fact, in the, in the, uh, in the edition where they, they first make the call for a League of Revolutionary Workers in 1965, uh, four years before uh, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers is formed. And they pretty much lay out in 1965 what that would look like. The power that black people had at the point of production because of racial capitalism, right? Meaning that their analysis was from being in and around those plants that because of the nature of racism on the job and in the unions, black people predominated at the earliest, heaviest, most what they used to refer to as man killing jobs at that time in the, in the plant. And because of that racism, they occupied the very beginnings of production. And they realized that if they organized black workers together, they could shut down Chrysler's entire production, right? Uh, and that was the basis upon which they, they analyzed their situation and they decided that their greatest amount of power was by organizing at the point of production. To me, and I think to General too, that was kind of a, a tremendous advancement in kind of like the uh, black liberation struggle in the 1960s, because they identified a, a particular place where they could wage struggle, and that was at the point of production. Uh, and I, th I think that that's pivotal. Uh, so they have this idea in 1965, and they, they understand it as a complex movement. It's not just workers or black workers. It also involves students and organizing the community, right? And so they write, uh, these long papers that are far too long for anyone to read, they'd pass them out, people would throw them out. But they learned in the process of, of their activities, right? And so by the time the Great Rebellion comes in 1967, they've learned from some of their mistakes. And so in the clip that we saw, when we see uh, Marion and Jen talking about making those newsletters, at this time, they're much more succinct. They're shorter, they're digestible. They've learned from the mistakes of the past and they start to put those things into action. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the importance of the rebellion on their ability to galvanize support for what they were doing. Uh, should be noted that like a month before the rebellion, there was a group in Detroit and it consisted of Kenny Cockrell, who was mentioned before, John Watson, General Mike Hamlin, others. Uh, they had a group called the Black Liberation Party, in which a month before the rebellion, they started to chart out a course for building a Black Liberation Movement in the city. But the impetus really comes uh, with the rebellion itself. And, and for those that are unaware of the scope of the rebellion, it's uh, the largest in the 60s, five days long in total, uh, 43 people are killed, uh, 33 Black people, uh, predominantly by the police and the armed forces that had occupied the city. I always like to tell my students this because it's kind of an unfathomable number, but when the rebellion occurred in Detroit, they called in so many armed forces, including the police, the state police, uh, surrounding police forces, uh, two sections of the army, the National Guard. There were 17 and a half thousand armed personnel in Detroit. And after 9-11, uh, for example, the United States invaded the entire country of Afghanistan 
with less troops than were in the city of Detroit in 1967, right? In fact, the National Guard during the rebellion fired 155,000 rounds of ammunition right throughout the city. And after the rebellion, people started picking these up and started drill pressing them and tying ropes through them and wore them as a medallion of, of strength of surviving the military occupation that people faced. And so what happened in the wake of that is you had a spate of organizing and it was only possible because people had already been doing that work, right? So they're able to kind of see the kind of clamoring for uh, some, somebody to give it some organizational shape. And this is what General and his peers really seized upon, first with the inner city voice and then by organizing the plants uh, first at Dodge, Maine, right? And this, of course, is where General got fired. And he got fired very quickly, I should add, right? They had a wildcat strike in May, and it was the first. And after this is when they formed Drum. And uh, it was actually called by two white women in the trim department, right? Uh, and General supported them and made sure that everybody stayed out in a way that, uh, you know, he and his comrades in that plant made sure nobody went back in that plant. But he was targeted and was fired as a result of that, right? And in fact, he couldn't find work in the plants until about 1973, 1974, because he had been blacklisted from the auto industry. He's only able to eventually get work in the plants because he uses the assumed name of a comrade from Ram uh, from Cleveland, uh, Alexander Ware, also known as Alexander Ware Bay. And then he hires into Ford. He's known throughout that plant as Big Al, right? Until uh, he's busted. However, in the contract, it said that if you had a job for over a year uh, and you maintained that job, then they couldn't fire you. So he winds up going to, uh, he has to have a hearing. And I wanted to kind of tell this story and I'll, I'll perhaps end here, but I, I think it kind of reflects on the black radical tradition and the, the, the weight of McCarthyism, right? Uh, because the gentleman that represented uh, uh, general during his grievance hearing was a, was a man named David Moore. And David Moore was a black communist uh, from Detroit who had been blackballed by Walter Ruther for his involvement in helping to organize black workers and from being associated with the CP at the initial organizing struggle uh, at the Rouge plant, right? Dave Moore had been in the National Negro Congress and was organizing people into the union you know, behind the scenes because you had to do that because because Ford had his goons, right? Uh, and what what's so tragic is General was relatively unaware of Dave Moore until Dave Moore finally got hired back into the union after Ruther's death and was able to defend Jen and get him his job back, right? So he could maintain his job at the Ford plant. General used to say that he didn't get back pay though. So he said he did 40 years to get 30 years, right? Uh, and I bring that up because it shows the power of uh, repression on kind of keeping the ties that bind radical activists and revolutionary activists together. And one of the most uh, prescient things about General today is that he often did work that uh, as other people kind of adapted to shifting times during the uh, uh, Reagan era, Jen stayed true to his analysis and his belief that capitalism had to be overthrown, right? And sometimes that led to kind of, in the, particularly in the 80s, times when mobilizations and activities, there'd be 10 people there. And General used to make the argument, you, you know, we've been here before, we have to just wait until the few have become many, right? And I think that's critically important because while we focus on kind of like people who are active and the work that they're doing, and in this case, General was quite young when Drum was formed, we sometimes leave out the part of them keeping this tradition of revolution alive, right? And he carried forth that struggle. He bridged generations, right? And now the few are becoming many and General is the ideal person to kind of learn from and to learn from not only kind of what he did, but also how he adapted to shifts in the broader political economy and responded accordingly. So I, I thank you for your time, and I hope I did well enough following Dr. Ransby, who I have a great deal of respect for.
And then, uh, David, are you showing some videos? Did you have video clips? No, I think Colleen is helping. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, I had one short audio clip, I'm sorry. Uh, and this, this uh, pertains to Hamlet Fire, which occurred in 1991, uh, you know, chicken McNugget processing plant in which uh, workers were killed at the fire. But it's general talking about the question of, of solidarity and kind of bridging kind of the racial class and gender divides. And I think it's fitting for a May Day celebration and kind of to his evolution as a, as a revolutionary. And in the process of solidarity, I learned some things. And I gave this example once before, because it's the most bitter one I learned in my life. It's an event that took place on October the 3rd, 1991, uh, in a little city called Hamlet, North Carolina, at a, a factory called the Imperial Foods that produced chicken nuggets. And what happened on that September the 3rd, a fire broke out in that factory. And 25 workers died in that fire. When the word spread across the country, we all got angry and upset. We raised money at our local and our region, and we sent packages of money to the survivors of that. But that was not enough. Our anger had to take uh, more of a direct affront. On May the 2nd uh, of 1992, we organized five busloads of workers out of Region 5. We collected money, and we rode to, Mon uh, to Hamlet, North Carolina. We got there, it was a gruesome sight. We got a chance to go inside the factory and we saw, you know, the, uh, what used to be the refrigerators that became the tombs of most of those workers. You can see the flesh marks you know, on the doors as they clawed and tried to get their way out. But the owner of the factory had, had chained all the doors shut because he clowned, somebody was trying to steal his chicken nuggets. We marched through the streets of Hamlet that day when we got to the rally at the park, it was a real spirited rally, but one of the most bitter lessons that we had to learn was out of the 25 workers that died in that factory, 13 were white and 12 were black. Not a single one of the white fam members of the white families showed up at that rally, even though the money was for everybody. And it was a bitter pill for us to swallow, you see? This question of solidarity is not an easy question. It gotta be fought for. You see, the factory united them. The process of the production of chicken nuggets united them. The fire that broke out in that factory that day united them. The slow hand of death that touched 25 workers united them. But brothers and sisters, the streets divided them. When we raise our voice to sing solidarity, we got to fight to give that meaning. You know, the song says solidarity forever. It don't say solidarity for eight hours. It don't say solidarity to the midnight hour in case you're working the second shift. That song says solidarity forever. And every time we raise it and fight for it, we got to fight to give that meaning. Wow, that is one of my favorite uh, uh, speeches that he's done. Um, I've definitely learned a lot from Jim. And uh, I wanted to next, uh, thank you so much again, David, uh, for all that history. And there were definitely gems in there. Uh, but I want to next show this uh, video. It's a multimedia political project that I had the opportunity to work on with uh, Pauline Pisano, who is my bandmate and comrade within the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival, as well as filmmaker Peter uh, Kanoy, uh, who is one of my OGs and has been an incredible partner and comrade in this process. This video was inspired by a uh, revolutionary struggle, the beauty and power of our humanness, uh, which I feel like Jen is such uh, an incredible illustration of all the things that a revolutionary must be. One who is committed to the movement, to the struggle, who is connected to the working class internationally, who is uh, competent in the ability to carry out the goals of a revolutionary um, and uh, who is uh, that marker of intelligent and unselfish leadership that uh, W.E.B. E. Du Bois uh, says that our movements need. And so without further ado, wanting to share this video in honor of Jen and the Black radical tradition. 
Detroit. Detroit is the high bringer of the nation. Yes, it is. Look out, because everybody else is headed this way. That's right. The the technology that we got confronted with because we was one industry industry town is gonna hit every industry everywhere. They are not going back on technology. Okay, technology. 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 Because the capitalists got it all. They got all the money. It's enough money in this society to feed the earth, earth, earth. But they got it all. And we ain't got it. One you know, and, and our strategy is to try to figure out a way to go get it. There are metals in the sky. So many particles being littered about the halo of our precious earth. There are metals in the sky and it's getting harder and harder to breathe. This is warfare, salt of the earth, a world that puts people over profit is possible. With every red heartbeat on the streets of Detroit, Caracas, Lancaster, Jerusalem, Flushing, Durham, Miami, LA, and beyond. Capitalism is dying. We must unite in order to ensure its demise.
what's that famous quote that I always use from Frederick Engels? Oh, yeah. Where he says, um, what childish innocence it is to use one's own impatience as a theoretically convincing argument. Mm-hmm. Don't go blaming the people for not moving. Blame yourself. It's self. That's usually what happens when people rise up and the leaders then got demoralized and quit. <laughs> and then when the folks rise up, ain't nobody there to lead them. You need patience and That's persistence right. and stay with that movement because people do change. Thank you so much again to Peter Pauline, the New York State Poor People's Campaign. Thank you so much with Pam for bringing to life uh, again, resurfacing this incredible history, this incredible life uh, that must be remembered in our struggles. And we must look to General Baker as that beacon for us to follow as folks who are developing as revolutionaries uh, to come. And so we want to continue. We have another clip. Uh, with General Baker from one of the interviews that Pam did. And then we would like to turn it over to Pam again, our fearless leader, our director who has brought us together uh, with uh, this, this uh, discussion. Um, before we go into the clip, I just want to say um, Pam is a Bronx-based documentary filmmaker, educator, and activist. She loves listening to people tell stories about standing up to injustice in their own unique, subtle, and not so subtle ways. Pam learned to make films in the 1980s alongside her students at the Arturo Schomburg Satellite Academy in the Bronx. In addition to Detroit 48202, conversations along a postal route, Pam's films include Making the Impossible Possible, the story of Puerto Rican studies at Brooklyn College, which I'm excited to see, which she co-directed with Tammy Gold, Cuban Roots, Bronx Stories, with the stroke of the Cheveta, remembering the Mamacelo tree, and disobeying orders, GI resistance to the Vietnam War. Pam has received numerous grants and awards, including Just Films, Ford Foundation, the New York State Council on the Arts, the Puffin Foundation, Latino Public Broadcasting, CUNY Caribbean Exchange, and the Bronx Council on the Arts. Pam owns, holds an MFA in the Integrated Media Arts from Hunter College, CUNY. She is a member owner of New Day Films Distribution Cooperative, New York Women in Film and Television, and the Bronx Filmmakers Collective. I love Pam. Pam is a beautiful comrade and revolutionary. I've enjoyed getting to know you over the last couple of years. Uh, so let's get into the clip and then Pam, you'll take it away. Cuba was added to the, to the US passport as a place you couldn't go in 1962. So the Cuban Federation of Students sent a group of students to Cuba in defiance of the travel ban in 63. So the following year, uh, they, had, they wanted to send another group, and they wanted to make sure they got some black students, and they contacted our little organization. So we sent four people to Cuba. Uh, I was one of the four. But Cuba was a revolutionary laboratory. I played baseball with Fidel Castro. We met excuse me, with Che Guevara. I met Mohammed Babu, who led the revolution in Zanzibar. Before Zanzibar and Tanganyika was merged, they became Tanzania. I met Chikorema and all of these freedom fighters from Rhodesia and South Africa that had been wounded and came to Cuba to convalesce. It was a revolutionary laboratory. I spent days with Robert Williams and Mabel, his wife. They're explaining to us the details of the struggle in Monroe, North Carolina. So I got an education in Cuba. You're on, yeah. So this is so wonderful. Thank you, everybody. Yes, Cuba was a revolutionary laboratory. I got an education in Cuba. I chose that clip 
to frame my few words for a couple of reasons. First, General Baker's description of his experience in Cuba in 1964 underlines internationalism of his working class politics that both Barbara and, and David have um, emphasized. And it's, again, it's just so important to point out this being a May Day celebration and all. Second, in a roundabout way, that trip to Cuba is the first connection I have to General. So the US government did not take lightly the fact that 84 young people broke the travel ban to go express solidarity with and learn from the Cuban people. When the group returned from Cuba, the House Un-American Activities Committee subpoenaed the leaders of the group and threatened them with contempt of court and all kinds of other scary stuff. So coincidentally, in 1964, HUAC also went snooping around Buffalo, New York, where my family lived. HUAC was investigating Progressive Labor Movement, a newly formed communist group that my father was a member of. One of the things HUAC was so concerned about was PLM's connection to that trip to Cuba. Around the same time that General Baker was refusing to cooperate with the draft board in Detroit, my father was refusing to cooperate when he was called before HUAC in Buffalo. Long story short, because of HUAC, my father got fired from the University of Buffalo and we all ended up in Detroit. Turns out Wayne State University was the only school in the US willing to give Paul Sporn a job. I must have been about 12 or 13 when my father told me he was going to meet with someone named General Baker. And being such a politically aware child, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why my dad was going to meet with a general. I mean, we were supposed to be protesting against the Vietnam War. I can't say I crossed paths with General Baker growing up. He and my dad were in different left formations, shall we say. But I can say that the radical black workers movement that General helped develop and lead was a huge part of the total political ambiance that impacted me as a child growing up in Detroit in the 1960s and 70s. It couldn't be avoided. It was in the air and my generation learned and benefited from it. Here's an example. I was in the ninth grade at Highland Park High School, which was a block or two away from the headquarters of the League of Revolutionary Black, Head, uh, League of Revolutionary Black Workers over on Cortland. I wasn't aware of that at the time, but I do remember walking into one of my classes and someone had written Ford Plantation in big letters on the chalkboard. I said, wow, they're comparing the Ford factory to a plantation. They're making a connection between workers being exploited in the auto factories to enslaved people being exploited on plantations. It taught this 14 year old white girl something about racism and capitalism. So if General got an education in Cuba, I got an education in Detroit. 40 years later, I'm making the film Detroit 48202 with Wendell Watkins, my friend from Cast Tech. The idea being that Wendell's postal route and his customers represented a microcosm that could reveal a from the ground up telling of the city's history of working class struggle, disinvestment by industry and community led revitalization. Early in production, I was telling Barbara Ransby about Wendell's customers who we were interviewing and some of the powerful stories they were telling us. Miss Owens talking about how as a teenager, she and her family was one of the, some of the first people to move into the Sojourner Truth Homes under armed guard, of course. Mr. Hewitt talking about coming up to Detroit from West Virginia in the 1950s, getting fired from Ford and hired at a DeSoto plant in the very same day. Kim Moore, remembering being six years old during the 67 rebellion and her grandmother pulling her in from the porch out of fear that she'd be shot by the National Guard troops riding down their street. Barbara said something like, those are really good stories. How are you gonna insert a broader political and historical analysis? Why don't you interview General Baker and Marion Kramer? I didn't know if they'd want to be bothered with me, but when I reached out, General and Marion were more than accommodating. That interview did just what Barbara suggested it might do. General and Marion laid out Detroit's history 
of about 100 years from a radical class perspective. And they gave an overall context to Wendell's insightful reflections and his customers' powerful memories. General took on the role of a griot in the film, a voice we keep returning to for wisdom. So I'm so grateful for Jen's and Marion's participation in Detroit 48202 because I wanted the film to remain rooted in community voices rather than talking heads. I'm not saying that to diminish the contributions of scholars Tom Segru and John Man June Manning Thomas. They provided invaluable history and insight. And what I loved about both Professor Segru and Professor Thomas being in the film is that they both have deep personal ties to the city, not just scholarly ones. But the film had to push to the center the voices of Detroiters who built the city's wealth, wealth who fought to break through racial and economic barriers, changed Detroit and continued to do so. So I'll end by remembering General Baker fondly and saying thank you to Marion and Carolyn for sharing him with the world. And thank you for developing the General Baker Institute to keep alive the movement that he so much committed himself to. Thank you, everybody. I always have hope. I have, I have, uh, I have faith in the working class. Mm -hmm. I've always got that type of hope because I know I've seen them rise up before, and I, I know when they rise, you have to either you gonna rise with them, or you gonna move your butt aside. In concrete examples of, of well, I, and for any example, you know, it rises to a much smaller scale. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was just shocked at Dodge Maine. When we went out there for the first time and the second time, you know, to pass out those leaflets and workers start staying out. It took a while for them to get it in their head. They had even some white workers saying, stay out. Mm -hmm. Cause if they ask me, I'm staying, you know, and some of them, you know, and I, we, all of a sudden it came a day, they stayed and they began to realize they found they shut Dodge Main down. You need patience. And That's persistence right. and stay with that movement because people do change. Uh, when we struck Dodge Main, we didn't oh know what God. to do that morning when we set them conga drums out at the plant gates and started beating the conga drums and thousands. Them, and we looked up and we got 4,000 black workers on the street and don't know what to do with them. Don't let nobody think that huh. you knew what you was going to do with them because they're lying. You know, I always say be careful what you call for. Because somebody might answer. <laughs>
uh, General Baker Institute. It was started, um, first of all, it was, I, I picked that clip. We all got to pick a clip. I picked that clip because it shows both uh, my mom and my dad talking. Um, and so um, I always forget how blessed I am to have those two as parents because they're just mom and dad. Um, and so um, the relationships you have, some people have with their mom and dad is like, uh, yeah, mom and dad. Um, and so it's always good to hear how people feel about them when they when I talk to them. But the idea for the General Baker Institute started um, to show you kind of a revolutionary mindset my mom has is as soon as he passed away, um, and my dad passed away on May 18th. Um, and so one of the anniversaries of his passing will be coming up. So May is usually always hard for my family. But immediately after um, his passing, my mom kicked into education mode. She was like, we got to do education. Um, and, and also preserving um, our history. Um, we started an oral history project um, for opportunity for those. A lot of people have written on the league. Um, a lot of folks have done forums on a league, but a lot of the members of the league never got to tell their stories. And she was like, you know, people have always made money off of our story, but we never get to tell our story. And so, um, so we started um, working on an oral history project. And it, it, some of those um, videos live on uh, a website, uh, revolutionaryblackworkers.org and some clips from that. Uh, and so, um, that's how it started. She wanted to try to record, his, to get the oral history of, of folks who uh, were a part of this history. And if folks are still out there who we haven't recorded, we still, and you're watching this, we still want to record you. Um, and also the importance of educating. Um, she wanted to have a center where we can do education. But as we sit here today, I'm sitting here and Dave is sitting right across from me. Uh, we are currently inside uh, the General Baker Institute, which sits at the old maze printing uh, company um, that was on Livernois. It's the first black printing company in the city of Detroit. So the General Baker Institute is a print shop. We always say we're a print shop. Um, but what that looks like um, and what that feels like um, if you ever got a chance to meet him um, and hang out with him and have a relationship with him, this space tries to embody him as a person. So if you didn't get to meet him, when you come here and feel the warmness of the space and see the different diverse people in the space and um, the people sharing meals, um, people printing, uh, like one of the shirts that we print t-shirts, we have our own clothes, Dave's wearing one too, but we have a clothing line that we started for political education. Um, people having debates, people uh, having conversations, people skill sharing, um, uh, intergenerational conversations. While we're sitting in here, we have members of the league, uh, former members of the league who are in the other room watching this program. So um, people are always coming in and out. Um, we have book collections that, uh, we have the, the Baker's family collection here. Um, we have um, the Midwest Labor Library that my dad helped run that is coming over here. Um, so all of those things are in this space. So if you ever got to meet him, um, you will feel it. If you never got to meet him when you're in this space, you will feel it. And so this space is an extension of his life and his legacy. Um, you'll see many different folks in this space. Um, we are not, we have not had a grand opening because of COVID, but we were able to go out in the streets during the uprisings this summer and to um, be amongst and the young people who were um, fi fighting every day. And through that, we were able to bring out some of the elders to have conversations. And so we developed these relationships with young people and they found out about the space. So we never had an official grand opening, but for those who know about the space, they still come and drop in. Um, and what we're gonna show is one of the music videos um, that was, created over the summer by one of the young people who um, was marching every day with the organization Detroit Will Brief. And you'll see images in this music video of young people coming together. Um, and reason why, other reason I picked that clip and I love how um, the video that Sierra and them did, had, had he said, we gotta figure out a way to go get it. And in this clip, you will see that energy still alive today in Detroit. Um, and so, I'm gonna end there. So General Baker Institute, you can follow us 
on uh, social media platforms, find out more about us. Like I said, we haven't had an official grand opening, but we are open, open. And ways you can support the General Baker Institute is to come here, have a conversation with us. Um, people have brought books. Those All the books I have in the space right now um, are donations that people brought. People brought coffee cups, you know. People come here, if you ever had a grandmother uh, on, a, on a neighborhood street in that house that people hung out at and they came to just because they wanted to see who was there or they just felt like coming to hang out. That's kind of the space and that's how it's become. And people have um, come and brought things and um, always accept uh, monetary uh, donations, but more so than that, the conversations and the, the relationships that we are trying to build um, because folks are so fractured right now. And so it's so important to build relationships in order to connect folks to the fronts of struggles that are out here. Um, and so that's what we do um, here. When you first enter the space, you'll see stuff from the Poor People's Campaign. Um, you'll also see that our task is to make thinkers out of fighters and fighters out of thinkers are the first things that hit you when you walk into this space. And then you'll see other banners. You'll see a Wu-Tang banner. <laughs> you'll see a Yemeni liberation uh, movement banner. Um, so you'll see all these movements coming together. Um, and, and, that's, and, and that's a sign of people coming together um, to fight a bigger cause. And so this video is by Jay Bass. Um, he was one of the organizers with Detroit Will Breathe. He is one of the organizers with Detroit Will Breathe, and I hope you all enjoy it. 15 days. 11, 12 days. Two weeks, 21 days. It's been a month already. Day 41, we just getting started. It's day 50. 55 days. We prepared to go another 55 days. <laughs> It's been 65 days. 71 days out here. 75 days later, I say that we are freedom fighters. Day 100! We ain't gonna let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gonna let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gonna let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gonna let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. So taking these steps. What's going on? I know that it's wrong. Just take a deep breath. Gotta be strong and keep moving on. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. I'm getting sick and tired of being sick and tired When the hate gon' stop getting pulled over I ain't even driving, I just pray to God It ain't a racist cop If I go to jail, don't even put me in a holding cell I'm finding out They really trying to trap me in a system Put me in a prison, what I'm finding out Not me, young king But they trying to do me like I'm Rodney Gotta find me I ain't hiding if you looking for me I'm in my streets with about 3,000 people Who ain't leaving till we get some justice I mean it if you think I'm bluffing The police, you know they can't be trusted So we gotta stand up for it People united will never be divided. Got a chance just for it. Got a plan stuff for it. Looking at their budget like fuck it. We gon' just demand most of it. Got a lot of stuff that we could do with that. We could get some money to the school with that. Tell me what you would do if some of you was black. We ain't got no option now. We shoot it back. Blah. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. So I'm taking these steps. What's going on? I know that it's wrong. Just take a deep breath. Gotta be strong and keep moving on. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. Look what they did to G. Look what they did to Bree. Look what they did to E. Look what they did to me. Hit me with tear gas, pepper spray to the face, and I couldn't see. Then the next week, DPD ran me over with an SUV. You know that they don't care about us Anytime that you hear about us They say that we violent, causing a riot Okay, let me clear it all up They don't like it when you telling the truth And when your skin got that melanin too They wanna silence that So they gon' show it to your protest Riot get shields that you looking like Damn, where the riot at? You know it's all part of their plan But God's plan way larger than man I've been working hard as I can Know what's coming, see it all in advance You know it's fate when they fall in your hands And everybody around you all understand What it's gonna take is the people together And you know they hate to see us together Let's go we ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. So I'm taking these steps. 
What's going on? I know that it's wrong. Just take a deep breath. Gotta be strong and keep moving on. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. We ain't gon' let up. Whole squad here, we fed up. March today. 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 Yo, Jay Bass, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Carolyn and the GBI. Who all over there from the, the league? Who, who's over there? We got Mitch and Alonzo in the room. Uh, oh, Lord. <laughs> the Mitchell. Oh, Lord. Yes, we had the opportunity, uh, like Carolyn said, General Baker Institute is a place to come together to organize and also as Jen will, you know, have it no other way to be educated. And I got a chance to uh, also get to know some of the members of the league through that study on the Negro national colonial question. And speaking of questions, uh, we are now getting into our Q and A and we've asked for folks to submit questions into this Q and A box on the Zoom, if you are on the Zoom, and if you are on YouTube, we are paying attention to the comments if you'd like to enter in a question in the chat. Uh, again, uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you to Rita and Colleen for the tech and Elizabeth for the captions. Uh, we could not have this event without all of that incredible work. I'm gonna pass it over to Zilla um to open up the panel and we would like to also welcome into this space Marion Kramer if she's over there she's not over there okay <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like let me pause before I start talking um so like yeah first like I just want to say wow um General Baker is still helping educate a new generation of freedom fighters um and that video off off the hook like loved it love every moment of it um so we do have one question from um joseph price off of youtube i remember the clp bookstore on Wood woodland avenue um what happened to the clp comrades um in the motor city or anywhere else um, is there anyone still around doing what, those revolutionary things? Can anyone answer that from Detroit or know this information? Or one of the Mitchells? What was the question? What was it? Sorry, what was the question again? I'm sorry. Okay. What happened to the CLP bookstore on Wood, Lin, Linwood Avenue? What happened to the comrades? Um, in the Motor City or anywhere else, are they still doing revolutionary things? Yeah, the <clears throat> the people right next door were in the CLP, uh, and hopefully we're working to get one of them here to talk in a second. Carolyn's working on it, but that bookstore was the China Albania bookstore, I believe, on Linwood, and prior to that, it was the uh, uh, Black Star uh, bookstore. They had a press with the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, as well as two bookstores, one of which was on DeQuinder. So I think the bookstore shut down, I believe in the late seventies. And, you know, there are people from the CLP who are all over the city that remain active. Uh, Frank Joyce is one uh, who, who remains active uh, in the city, obviously Mitch and Lonzo. Uh, a lot of the people that were in the CLP, uh, Marsha, who was here before, was in the CLP and she's still active in the political sphere as well as in the arts. So part of that generation is the fact that like General used to say, uh, you know, the victory is in the fight. And most of the people that were involved live that on a daily basis. You know, most of the people that were in the CLP continued to be involved in politics, whether it was in an offshoot of that formation or something else. Um, did Carolyn get one of them? Well, on? they're just going to wave at the people. Can y'all say hi to yeah. the people? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. How's everybody doing? Hi, everybody. <laughs> let me, let so, me just... Oh, sorry. 
Uh, I, no, go let ahead. In, let me jump in for one second. You couldn't really see him, but Alonzo here was one of the leading figures of Elrum. And Elrum was such a critical uh, movement within the Revolutionary Union movement. Uh, and it was the only gear and axle plant that Chrysler had in the United States. I believe the only other one was in South Africa. So when they shut down that plant, if they had shut it down for more than one day, they literally would have shut down all of Chrysler's operations. Wow. Um, yeah, because I just know for myself, a lot of the um, clips and um, what everyone was saying um, really struck me and some things really came out um, that leads to our next question. Like, what does it look like to be a revolutionary today? Anyone from the panel can take this. I think Barbara should take that. <laughs> <clears throat> I just decided to, I, I'm starting a new book project, which is called, Are We Ready for a Revolution? Um, it's deliberately posed as a question um, because I think, you know, those of us who've spent time on the left, the question is, you know, time, place, and conditions, right? What, what are, how do we understand the conditions um, that, that we live under right now? Are, is revolutionary change possible? And a much deeper discussion than we can have right now, I think, I think there's a real challenge to the left to ask the question, what does revolution look like and mean in the 21st century? Because I don't think it means and looks like it did in the 20th century. And so, uh, you know, there's a way we get frozen in time and we feel like we can reenact history, which we really don't have the choice or luxury to do. We're, we're in a different historical moment. So I think, you know, my view is revolution. My, when I was 18, I thought it was an event. It would happen. And on the other side, everything would be fine and dandy. Uh, uh, but, but I understand now, you know, that it's really what leads up to um, and what happens after various critical events. So, you know, revolution is a protracted process, not an event is, is the first thing. And, you know, so often failures and revolutions are, you know, amalgam of, of successes and failures. It's not just one or the other, but when there is a major shift in power and we can redefine the basic, you know, contours of society, right? Where uh, oppressed people are no longer um, marginalized and out of power, then we have the challenge of figuring out what do we have the consensus and capacity to build? And, um, you know, it's more than a notion. So I don't take that question lightly and it's not a question I can even attempt to answer in the few minutes that we have together. But, but I do think we're in a period because of climate, because of the current crisis of capitalism, which is multifaceted and, and it's not cyclical, it's, it is uh, a game changing crisis and they know it. Uh, I think we are looking at the potential of, of uh, radical transformation in the society. And so um, are we ready for that as a question? So we should continue to ask and take stabs at answering. Very important question. And there it is, because we got to, um, and this goes to our next question. Um, and then we're going to wrap up because we're, nah, I probably shouldn't say it, but we're done at 530, right? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we'll take a time. Um, so what did General Baker mean by turning thinkers into fighters and fighters into thinkers? Like, what do you think, um, you know, that vibe is? Um, who like, yes. You want me to answer? Uh I'll take a crack at that. Um, you know, you have a lot of people that, that, that study uh, theory uh, and organizing strategies uh, and think about things very deeply, but don't necessarily have the will or the capacity uh, to, to get out and actually do the fighting. And conversely, you have people who are willing to fight. You know, General in the early 60s had a Malcolm X speech. Malcolm X in the message to the grassroots says, y'all are afraid to bleed. And General and his comrade said, we'll bleed, Malcolm, we'll bleed, right? So you need the will to fight, but you also need the intelligence to fight and the study to fight is what Barbara was saying before. And you can't do one effectively without the other. And I think that's the core message that he was getting at. And the fact that study and praxis and, and reevaluating uh, throughout the process of revolutionary struggle is critical. Perfect. Does, um, Carolyn, I feel like there was a voice with you that wanted to say something. 
No, they said that was good, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, let's bring um, our international comrades into the, well, the Zoom room. Um, sorry, I want to get to the question. Um, yeah, can we just talk about the working class international struggle? Um, and also let's try to intertwine that with the working, um, with the struggle of the poor and dispossess in the United States, because um, it really sticks out to me um, with the, the chicken nugget clip about how like the streets divide us and continue to divide us. And that's one way that I sometimes see that like um, we people living in the United States can't get with the international struggle because there's like divide and conquer that we're sometimes conditioned to. So um, yeah, who would like to talk about that, especially as we just had May Day Should I call in somebody? Okay. I, I mean, I can say something. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, you know, internationalism is, is is more important today than ever. It's always been uh, important. Uh, we can't have a U.S. only and U.S. centered uh, view of what. Uh, social transformation will mean in this coming period. And I think from, you know, this, you know, the rise of right wing dictators from the Philippines to Turkey to, uh, to Brazil, um, as well as the movements for transformation that are coming, the grassroots movements from Ecuador, you know, again, from Venezuela, uh, movements in South Africa that are trying to take, you know, what we had hoped would be a radical transformation um, uh, two decades ago to another level at this point, you know. Um, so I think there's a lot, there's a lot of hope in the world, what's happening in Chile right now. There's a lot of hope. And I think we need to have transnational formations that connect us to folks around the world. What I will also say though, is this, you know, I use the term racial capitalism. And I think when we talk about the working class, there's a, there is a fight in this country right now within the left, which is um, the sort of colorblind notion of, or sort of class reductionism. And I think if anything I take from the radical black left in Detroit is that that's an artificial separation. And so that's true in the world as well. We need to look at what's happening in terms of, of persistent um, uh, examples of colonialism, a pers persistent um, imperialist uh, uh, attitude and policies vis-a-vis -vis the global South. And even though, you know, Biden is, uh, doing some, I mean, you, it's hard to get worse than Trump, but I mean, Biden is uh, taking some steps to provide some relief to people domestically because a movement has pressured him to do that. But when we look at some, some foreign policy moves, um, they, are, they are very scary. We also still have the issue of Palestine, which many people on the left uh, refuse to speak out about, which we must speak out about. Um, and um, so I, you know, I just, those issues come to mind and it's easier said than done. I think we still are figuring out what principal solidarity looks like because we can't just say we are with the people of country X or country uh, Y because we have to know the struggles in those countries to know where to land and where to, where to direct our solidarity um, because they're often complex and, uh, uh, and layered. So yes, important principle, fight hard for it every day, study, serve and struggle. Perfect. Um... So I would like to, I know we are a little pushing it on time. I just want to, um, my co-moderator, Sierra, she would like to say something. But I do want to just say first, thank you all for this great panel. I wish we just had more time. And um, yeah, Sierra. <laughs> I think I missed Q2K in the chat, but it's OK. Um, yeah, I think. General Baker is an incredible example of working class internationalism. I know that uh, one of Jen's comrades, who is also an OG of ours, uh, Willie Baptist, who was a part of the Watts uprising in 1965, which was a big inspiration uh, for the uprisings which were to follow, including in uh, Detroit, um, even though the character of the uprising in Detroit was much different. But uh, he talks about after the uprising in Detroit, 
there was a letter sent to the people, or sorry, the uprising in Watts, there was a letter sent to the people of Watts by the Vietnamese people in struggle, thanking them for the uprising, because they said that because of the Watts uprising, there was a deployment that was supposed to happen of military people to Vietnam. And because of the uprising that occurred, the military were sent to Watts instead of to Vietnam for its scheduled deployment. And so it was able to give uh, the Vietnamese people a bit of a, a more of a fighting chance. And so I feel like when we think about working class internationalism, that's what it's about. How do we actually organize our struggle here in the United States? How are we able to build the working class so that we can be coordinated enough to strike a real blow at the empire to make sure that the empire um, is so busy with us kicking their ass um, <laughs> that they're not going around causing all this trouble. Um, and so, yeah, thank you so much uh, for having us. And yeah, Pam, I'll turn it to you. Okay. This has just been so inspirational. And I want to thank everybody for attending, all of the participants. We encourage you to follow and support the work of all the co-sponsors of this event. General Baker Institute, Social Justice Institute, New Day Films has an incredible array of films about social justice and struggle, People's Forum and Code Pink. And if you're an educator or an organizer, you can get my film, Detroit 48202 from New Day Films. Look out for David's forthcoming, forthcoming bio of General, it should be great. And special thanks to our uh, moderator, Ciara and Zilla, Thanks to Rita and Colleen, our tech wizards. Thanks for hosting us, People's Forum. And um, happy and thank you, Elizabeth, for your closed captioning. Really committed to accessibility in all of our media work. So happy May Day. And as General would say, the victory is in the fight. So. <laughs>